Hello and welcome back to the Goodness Lover Show. Today we're joined by Dr. Drew Ramsey, who's a pioneer in the nutritional psychiatry space. He's here to tell us about how food impacts depression and anxiety. We cover a lot in this interview, so be prepared to learn about BDNF, how to grow your brain, gut health, fiber, inflammation, and all of the above. And we had a lot of laughs. So let's dive in. Dr. Drew Ramsey, it is wonderful to be with you today to talk all things in nutritional psychiatry. You've just come out with your new book, Eat to Beat Depression and Anxiety, and we're so excited to dive into it all. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Matt and Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here and also to talk with your audience because you've had some of the real legends in nutritional psychiatry, Uma Nadu, who I, I, I know and adore. So it's really exciting to be here with you and to talk about the new book, and especially now, as we're all talking about our mental health, what can we do to better feed our, our brain cells and take care of our mental health? Wonderful. Thank you so much. I would love to start the interview by talking a bit about you. How did you get into this field? Because nutritional psychiatry, it's, an, it's a kind of a new thing. How did you get into it? It's an, it's, it, that's a great question. Thank you for that. <laughs> and, and it's exciting for me because it's not been a new thing for me. It's been a lonely thing for me. I've been one of the few nutritional psychiatrists really in, in the States. I mean, my first book on the subject came out in 2011. And so I started right at, during residency uh, I was like 2004, I finished my training at Columbia. So at that point I'm 30 years old and, and all this data is coming out about food and mental health. And it just really strikes me that we don't, we don't incorporate nutrition at all. When we uh, interview patients, when we think about therapy, when we think about interventions, when we think about treatment plans, it's just not part of how we operated in psychiatry. And it just seemed like a huge opportunity to me. And then the data started to come in and then really over the past five years, the data is really Excited. So you asked me a personal question. I don't mean to be some like wonky academic and be like, let me tell you, let me tell you about the data, Sarah. It's like really compelling. Uh, on the personal level, I guess mental health has just always mattered to me, um, just in, in my own personal challenges with my mental health, mainly just probably mood and some anxiety, but um, just coming from a family that's had a variety of mental, variety of flavors of mental health challenges. It's it, it sort of some psychiatry has always mattered to me in medicine is just the most interesting part of medicine, the most interesting part of who we are, our brains, how they function, how they don't, um, how we all have to work to get a harness on our sense of ourselves and our ambitions and, and a notion of how our brains work and who we are as individuals. It's uh, So that's always been, I don't know, like deeply exciting and personal and nerdy all at once for me. And then, and then the combination, I think just was in some ways, like a lot of people, right. I had this stuff in my personal life. Like I was like this weird vegetarian medical school. This is like finished medical school in 2000. So it was like 1997, like forever ago. (laughs) Right. And I'm like this like young, like long haired vegetarian, like low fat guy. And I'm in Indiana where it's like all pork all the time, pork and corn. And, (laughs) and, and I I love my Indiana folks, but it's and tomatoes. Let's not forget tomatoes. So, (laughs) It, it's a little strange. Um, and I would say that style of eating also wasn't exactly doing it for me. I was struggling a lot with my energy, with my mood. You know, some of that settled, I think, just as I got older and 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 probably better treatment and more therapy. But um, th- there had always in my mind been that real intentionality in, uh, around what you eat and how it affects your health and how you feel. That, that goes back to a lot. I was raised by kind of back to the earth sort of farmer American hippie people who like moved back. I'm talking to you now from our farm in really rural middle America. Um, and before I became a New York psychiatrist, this is, I mean, this is where we're from and we grew a lot of our food and still do. And um, so probably just as I evolved professionally, these two things kind of in a very personal way, my own interest in mental health. And and I just, I just really love being a psychiatrist, just such a, like I said, it's just such a cool field of medicine. Um, and then just thinking of, I don't know, in some way, simple farm boy way is like, all right, like what are all of the tools we can bring to this fight when someone's got depression and anxiety, you know, like how besides the psychotherapy, besides meds, like, is there other stuff? Can we bring in mindfulness? Can we bring in nutrition? Can we bring in exercise? And like, how as a clinician, can I 
in some ways both model that a little bit, you know, so I'm not just like talking the talk, but really, you know, trying to improve my own mental health through these methods. Um, but, but then makes it actionable for people. So it's not like some, I don't know, like crappy nutritional advice that everyone's been getting for a long time. Like don't eat salt, don't eat cholesterol. Don't eat. It's just like, that doesn't help people at all. Like regardless of whether that's scientifically right or not, like we'd uh, debate that forever. Right. But that just doesn't help people make any changes in their life that are meaningful. So. Awesome. So, so that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. That was like a long, Thank you, you took us on a journey with that. That was good. <laughs> I could see the long hair and you just surrounded by, you know, all the hillbillies and fighting, <laughs> fighting, fighting away. Um, so uh, for our previous guests, we've heard that, you know, this is a field that was perhaps a little bit, you know, people thought maybe it was not pseudoscientific, but there wasn't a lot of research on. And then there were some groundbreaking papers that came out that really just made some massive waves in the scientific literature land. Um, can you tell us about that experience for you as you got into this and saw this as, wow, I really need to take, pay attention to this? Well, it calmed me down because I was already talking about food, lecturing about food. I was speaking every year with colleagues at the American Psychiatric Association about the um, epidemiological data that exists. And so doctors and everybody loves to say, you know, correlation doesn't equal causation. So the fact that a Mediterranean or whole food style diet decreases the risk of depression in prospective trials by 30 to 50%, it's like, yeah, people are like, like sh show me the money, right? Show me the <laughs> randomized clinical trials. And then those started to come out. And, and now there have been four positive and one negative. And uh, so with randomized clinical trials, you can begin, even though they haven't been the biggest, you can begin to, to talk in more clear terms. I think that happened. The other thing that happened is conceptually we begin to shift. We begin to shift towards thinking about inflammation, not as like a buzzword in you know cardiology or in the wellness world, but as something that certainly is happening, is happening as a consequence of the food we eat and is happening because of you know, how those foods drive poor metabolic health and, and drive a lot of chronic inflammation. And, and, and so now the science is really between our understanding of the microbiome, all the bugs in our gut and how food affects that, and then how the microbiome affects inflammation and how inflammation infect, it infects, but it uh, affects <laughs> mood, um, cognition and anxiety. There's, there's, to me, it feels um, a more clear mechanistic understanding of what I think can feel dismissive to people in the field, right? The idea, if you have bipolar disorder, your kid has bad depression or ADHD and you, the kind of ideas that well you didn't eat the right food so you really messed up yourself or your kid you know that that's the kind of downside sometimes of nutritional psychiatry is is we're hoping to empower people and create agency i think the hesitation maybe you're speaking to in the field is around um often being with people who've tried lots of things and they haven't worked or as so many people with mental health concerns have, have experienced, right? You tell people you're depressed or anxious and ev everybody's got a tip. Like, <laughs> you know, have you like tried yoga? Like, have you tried breathing? Have you tried journaling? Like, like you, you know, should you should cheer now. up. Like, yeah, right. And so- You're not woke it, enough. It's, oh. Right, the, you're exactly. And the idea that like, you really just need like kale and oyster and salmon and then like, it's all good. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think that's a reductionistic way for us to think about our mental health. The idea that it's one factor that's silly, be that, you know, Zoloft or wild salmon or mindfulness or really good psychotherapy. It's a combination of these things that tends to improve people's mental health in the long term. Awesome. So let's start with anxiety um, because it's been part of your journey, been part of our journey as well. So specifically around anxiety, what are some of the... Um, you know, the research and the data, know, the data, <laughs> Sorry, we, say, we say data. data so well, I'd anxiety, like to say, you know, anxiety is like, it's strange because anxiety is at least in the U S it's the most prevalent, um, uh, mental health disorder was 40 million Americans. So that's over 10% of our population that, that went up during the pandemic. Uh, I don't know uh, what the rates are in Australia, but, but, you know, high, it's, it's a common mental health disorder. Anxiety is a little more approachable. We talk about being nervous. We experience it. It keeps us up. Um, anxiety disorders. Uh, those are generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, specific phobia, social phobia, or social anxiety disorder, rather it, it, you know, they, they're, 
overwhelming and very powerful anxious thoughts that begin to interfere with people's functioning. The difference between, you know, I, I go out to a party, I get a little nervous. I'm a, you know, I don't know, middle-aged guy. It's like, whatever, right? But take a deep breath and I go, as opposed to you really can overcome that anxiety. You get shut down in a certain way. You stay home, you begin to isolate, you begin to feel the fabric of your life start to fray a little bit because of your anxiety disorder. And so in terms of nutrition, anxiety has kind of been the bastard stepchild. All the data is about depression and about dementia. There are very few studies about anxiety. Now, in speaking with Felice Jack for, for the book, um, it was really a fun part to get to interview her. And, and I asked her specifically about this. I was like, Felice, I want to write to everybody because anxiety is more prevalent, but all the days on depression. And she talks about her classic, um, really uh, gold standard paper, the first trial to intentionally use diet to treat depression. The the headlines are all that the 32.3% of people who were in this trial who got the Mediterranean style diet intervention, which in that study was individual sessions coaching them about diet, when those individuals went full remission, 32.3%. And so that that is, uh, you know, groundbreaking, but she also said there was a similar result, not quite as strong statistically with anxiety, that there was a major reduction in anxiety as well. And so it, it's, um, uh, so I think that's just to note that didn't, you know, make the, the too much of the write up. There's a little correlational study about choline, which you find in eggs and tofu, but you know, we can't do a lot with correlational data other than what I just did, which is probably not use it so appropriately because it's correlational. Um, there's some data around things like with people have a, a gluten sensitivity, obviously. So about 75% of people with irritable bowel syndrome have anxiety as well. Understandably, if you've had serious problems with your gut, if your gut explodes, if you can't control your bowels, I've had a couple of periods of this like this in my life. It, it makes you incredibly anxious in all times. Um, so when individuals who have gluten sensitivity or celiac disease go on a gluten-free diet, their rates of anxiety go from about 75% of that population back down to about 20, 25%, which is uh, closer to normal, obviously. So there are those types of moves. I, I think then, you know, in terms of anxiety, what people often think about or get counsel on are stimulants, right? In terms of caffeine, theobromines, which are in dark chocolate, really anything that triggers a dopamine release. Um, anxiety is a little tricky because for some people, stimulants, whether it's a medication stimulant or whether it's like coffee and chocolate, it kind of settles them down because they focus and get some work done. Whereas other people, uh, when they in, who are anxious, when they encounter some of these substances or, or stimulants, they get really so much more anxious. And it's where, you know, everybody's got to value your mental health journey is your mental health journey. It's yours. And lots of people can comment, but it's not something that really should be done by committee sure. because the only person that has to live through it is you. And so I think that's frustrating to patients. It's certainly hard for clinicians where, so we're, you know, we're giving a educated guess, but we never know exactly what intervention is going to help somebody. I think what I do want people to hear is almost some intervention does help everyone. I mean, I think anxiety and depression are really treatable. Things I also like just in terms of anxiety, there's anxious eating. It's probably where people encounter it the most, right? Where we, we have carb craving or like I turn into like a little like cracker eating chipmunk when I get anxious, where it's like all the crackers and all the cheese. Um, so there's also that behavioral part that where different mental states trigger certain types of eating in us. And then I think the interventions where for me, like I know when I'm anxious, a really nice cup of tea with honey really settles me down. Or sometimes I get anxious, my tummy's a little upset. So I know it's better for me to kind of think around my day around really simple foods like cashew, uh, nut butter and banana cinnamon smoothie, right? Something that's really kind of settling and a lot of ginger tea and not you know, lots of big brain food salads, not because it's not good for me, just because when I'm kind of in that anxious state, sometimes I'm not settled down to really relax and digest more fibrous foods. So those, those are some of the sort of, I guess, data and clinical thoughts around, around anxiety. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm imagining someone listening to this, um, that perhaps they've had the conversation with their psychiatrist or, um, or whoever, some, um, the doctor in their life that they think that anxiety just lives in their brain. Um, so now you're talking about diets and all these um, different types of things. And they're just like, well, wait a second. I thought it was a chemical imbalance. How is my diet impacting my brain in that way? How do you take someone on that well, journey? Yeah, I would just say, like, I would ask people to think about where the chemical balance comes from. 
and where the chemicals come from. Like, let's just start with all these chemicals we're talking about, whether it's serotonin or brain derived neurotrophic factor, my new favorite brain molecule about brain growth or whether um, it's dopamine, like these start out as amino acids, they need certain cofactors like iron and uh, vitamin B9, they need to be transported into the brain. Like all that takes the proper nutrients, which, you know, it's not the hardest thing to get, but a lot of folks um, aren't getting the right and proper nutrition. Um, I like to really talk with folks about the new diet, uh, the new data rather, connecting diet, microbiome slash gut health, right? the types of bacteria that live in your gut, which really, to me, it's like having a zoo. Like if you got, if like your, you know, uncle in a foreign land, you got a little note one day, a little telegram, like, hey, Matt and Sarah, you, you guys inherited a zoo. And mm. you went over and checked out your zoo and you're like, wow, it was crazy. So many different animals. But Sarah had the idea and she's like, you know, let's let's have a carnivore style zoo. You know, I just kind of like <laughs> only feed the meat. Like, eventually you just have a zoo full of lions because all the plant eaters, they, they die off, right? And so our guts are a little like that. If you feed your gut lots of simple sugars and, and um, uh, industrial oils and food dyes and, and supplements, you end up with the different types of bugs living in your gut. And we know that the types of bacteria living in your gut is the microbiome. I'm sure everybody listening and your audience really has heard about this, but it, it, it's directly correlated to um uh, depression and anxiety. They're, they're the microbiome. Now we see that there's different there changes in the microbiome. We're still sort of scientists are figuring out how much of that are maybe changes because people with depression behave or act differently. How much of it is the uh, shift in microbiome actually is part of what's contributing to depression. Certainly, I think that we're going to understand that's a piece of it because if the gut ends up regulating inflammation, and inflammation is involved in a significant, some significant percentage of people with depression are struggling with also inflammation, that, that one of the ways we regulate inflammation is by improving gut and microbiome health. And so that would be one of the ways I'd sort of think about the chemical balance. The other is I just talk about this big super highway, the vagus nerve that comes down from our gut. It's kind of like hanging down here and, and just like watching, listening and, our gut communicates with the vagus nerve in a couple of ways. First of all, there's just nerves throughout the gut, but also the gut uh, um, creates a variety of hormonal and, and chemical signals that communicate with the vagus nerve. They then shift brain function. So there've been actually a few studies now, for example, one way to quell, there was a, a, a research study at University of Cork by John Cryan, where I talk about it in the book, where over a short amount of time, they could show a change in a psychological express, a psychological response to a stressor. They have a, a study where they put people's hand into really, really cold water, which is uncomfortable and it like stresses you out. But then it, well, if you do that to people and watch them, it really stretches them out even more. Like everybody, like your cortisol goes up and you start reporting stress levels and you can sort of observe it in a lab. So there's a study where they, they gave people a variety of probiotics and repeated the experiment and people just didn't have as much of a physiological response. And so I think what's um, one, again, to answer your question, how do you explain that diet relates to anxiety? Is, is I think one, I think people should experience it for themselves a little bit. What what happens after two weeks, three weeks? I asked for six weeks in the book and I walked through a six week plan to really try and as opposed to, you know, having some gimmicky like 14 day thing to think really what eaters need. One of the chapters in the book is called Eaters Heal Thyself, which is really helping people take a step back from diet culture and a step back from um, the fear mongering and the misinformation that's really permeated the wellness space in a lot of ways. And to think about what matters to them, what are your values? Like what matters to you ethically, morally, environmentally, what matters to you nutritionally? What do you have access to? What culture are you from? What foods make sense in the context of those culture? What foods remind you of home? These kinds of ideas. And, and then to really think about the food categories that some of our research and also, you know, sort of, uh, based on the dietary pattern research really sh describes when we think about like what makes a traditional dietary pattern, you know, you see more plants, more leafy greens, more legumes, more nuts, more whole grains. You see often more seafood and just a different relationship with meat, you know, either a lot less meat, like a lot of people don't talk about in the Mediterranean region, 
you know, there are all kinds of restrictions usually in like, you look at a Greek Orthodox culture and the dietary restrictions. It's not just like eat meat whenever it's very prescribed when and what and where also fasting happens a lot. And so it's, um, uh, I guess our, the hope is that people will look at these food categories and kind of begin to reconceptualize how they best can feed their brains and, and feel compelled to do so. Awesome. Mm, great. Thank you. So, um, okay, so we're, we're establishing that the fact that a lot of things are happening to influence those brain chemicals um, in our brain. You mentioned before um, BDNF. Yes. Um, that is such a hot topic for a lot of people. We love BDNF. <laughs> Tell us everything about it. <laughs> so BDNF, so one, one of the things I did in the, in the book was uh, I made a whole drawing for BDNF. Ooh. Because uh, BDNF is my my favorite brain chemical. And the reason I love BDNF is because it forces us to think in a new way about brain health. And it invites us into an idea that our brains are dynamic organisms. Our brains are constantly making new connections and, and, and really wired to continue growing new brain cells and, and, um, and learning and experiencing kind of increasing capacities for joy. However, a lot of how we live, we don't sleep, we don't eat the right foods, we have a hard time sometimes deepening our connections and relationships, and we struggle with a sedentary lifestyle. That all causes some headwinds to neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is this underlying phenomena or this, this idea that our brains grow and change in adult life. And BDNF is the hormone and neurotrophin is what it's called at the center of this. Um, what's very exciting then, so if you imagine this stuff is kind of, you know, people compare it to fertilizer, which I don't think is maybe the best analogy, but right. But <laughs> let's, let's say that's okay. okay. Um, it, if you think about it really serving three functions, coaxing the birth of new brain cells in the hippocampus, uh, helping brain cells that are in trouble um, kind of repair and heal, preventing apoptosis, cell death, um, and then helping brain cells make, do what brain cells do best, which is make new connections, make connections. Um, that, that's really the role of BDNF. And um, it, it's exciting. And I finished medical school in the year 2000, and we didn't really know about this. We didn't know about BDNF. We didn't know that you could have the birth of adult brain cells in the adult human brain. I mean, that's just like, we got taught like, here are your brain cells, like don't mess up, <laughs> like, you don't get any more. And it's not like you get lots and lots more, but you definitely can get more. Um, data actually links vitamin B12 and DHA um, and a Mediterranean style diet. Um, those two nutrients are directly linked to the size of your brain. And then Felice Jack had another nice study looking of individuals age 60 to 64, brain scan at the beginning, looked at their dietary pattern individuals who ate a traditional dietary pattern, whole foods, all the stuff we love, the nuts, the beans, the whole grains, the plants, the small fishies, they had a significantly larger brain four and a half years later than individuals who ate a more Western style or diet. And so, you know, more brain cells is good, especially in the hippocampus, a center of learning, emotional regulation. Like I want as many of those brain cells as I can get. And so that that's why we're jazzed about BDNF. And then you get jazzed about BDNF because you just start poking in like, hmm, like, what? Well, there's some nutrients that like seem to improve BDNF or are there any foods they even have like one study that have shown that they can protect people from severely low BDNF levels. And you realize there are, there's just a couple handful of studies, um, nuts are the, the food category. So there was a study of people given olive oil and people given nuts, which is interesting because you'd think olive oil, like, like that's like brain lube, right? I mean, olive oil is great, but um, the nuts were what protected people from severely low levels of BDNF. And now BDNF is not a perfect biomarker. It's not like I measure BDNF in my patients and all this stuff. It's just, um, it's just, I, I think it's a really interesting new framework, especially for folks who are in the kind of like chemical imbalance, it's all serotonin because antidepressants work by stimulating BDNF and fighting inflammation. That's one of the things I learned late in my career about Prozac. I learned like hmm. Prozac is like a massive central anti-inflammatory. It's like ibuprofen for the brain. And then you kind of scratch your head and you're like, huh, like, well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, it also um, fosters more transcription of BDNF. 
But anyway, back to the food, food like zinc, magnesium, uh, long chain omega three fats, and then a few of the phytonutrients like the flavanols found in dark chocolate. One of the reasons I recommend dark chocolate, why it made the cover of the book, right? It's not just to sell <laughs> book, but you know, the brain food. And like, here's your cheat day right here. Here's your cheat day. I knew not at all. the dark I'm chocolate, I was onto something. I just knew it. The dark chocolate's there for a real reason. It's uh, a. <laughs> Not just to tease us on the cover. So did the um, did the scientists that did the nuts and olive oil study have any hypotheses as to why the nuts were superior? What is it about them? It's a mystery of nuts, Sarah. No one knows. It's, uh, <laughs> I I don't know. There there isn't a secret ingredient that we know. I I would guess it's a combination of. Um, you get a nice mix of slow burning carbs, fiber, some, a little protein and monounsaturated fats. You get that with the, you get the monounsaturated fats with the olive oil too. And then you get a little bit more minerality in some nuts. Um, I wondered if it was almonds, whether it was vitamin E, vitamin E is really interesting, fat soluble nutrient, really quite interesting for brain health. There are eight forms of vitamin E in nature. We only talk about the tocopherols, but there's this whole family of vitamin E called a tocotrienols. So, it, you know, it's, it's, um, so the short answer is I don't know exactly why there's no smoking gun, but it's, it's what I hope to see more of, which is how we can think about dietary pattern, microbiome health, metabolic health, and then think about uh, hopefully the next generation of biomarkers. I doubt it'll be BDNF, but something like that, that allows us to better understand whether people are getting into some sort of, you know, kind of pro problem in the way or the dynamics in which neuroplasticity works in their brain. Mm, great. Thank you. Um, you mentioned fiber before, and uh, as we've been diving into the topic of gut health over the last two years, of course, we love fiber. But can you tell us a bit how fiber would be good for your mental health? Fiber is good for your mental health because fiber and, and specifically prebiotic fibers that feed healthier, non-inflammatory strands of bacteria in your gut, um, that, that it's a fiber is key to that process. You can take all the probiotics you want. If you don't feed what I call the good bugs in my work with the idea that there are a set of organisms that seem to promote better health, better metabolic health. It's one of the reasons more plant forward or plant-based diets really tend, tend to be healthier um, is you get more microbiome diversity. Uh, so that, that's why we want people eating more fiber, fiber does some other things, you know, fiber also our bodies do a better job excreting certain toxins when we eat more fiber, fiber helps us keep us full. So we, we don't consume as many calories. Um, but mostly, you know, I think, I think about fiber also is fiber feeds the inner lining of our gut. So what we can't digest fiber. It's kind of cool, but about 20% of our calories get extracted by food, by the, from our food, by the bacteria. And then they make stuff. They make some of the same stuff we make. They make like serotonin, but they, they make these 13 fatty acids that feed the inside of our gut. So the very inside lining of our gut, like that inner layer of cells, it's pretty far from the blood supply, not super far. And so, um, to augment their like metabolic needs are the bacteria, um, that live inside of us, feed them. So I just think that that's kind of cool. They also make things like vitamin K2 that we we don't get much of in our diet, um, which is this unique form of vitamin um, K. They even make a little vitamin B12. So it's um, that's why, yeah, that's a long window. That, that's, those are some of the reasons I like more fiber in your diet. Awesome. And how are we typically, and I, at the Australian diet is quite similar to the American one. How are we going as far as fiber goes in a typical Western diet? So 68% of Americans don't meet the recommended daily allowance of fiber. And I think our, our recommended daily allowance is kind of low. I think just people do badly. I mean, it just I'm, something like, I don't know what percentage I, I saw 73% recently of, of food that Americans are consuming is packaged food. Um, let's just say a reasonable percentage. And so as you move into packaged foods, you lose fiber, right? Uh, um, or it gets added in in ways that people don't particularly like, like, I mean, the nice thing about plants, at least I like plants is that you chew them, you have an experience of them. I don't know. It's not just like when you take a fiber pill and you get this like big lump of fiber. Um, I, so yeah. Also one of the reasons to eat plants is, you know, we, 
like when you take a fiber pill, right? You got to drink a lot of water because you need, otherwise you're going to like dehydrate yourself. It pulls you out of you end up constipated. And so the nice thing about plants is they come with water and fiber. And so it, it's kind of makes it easy to stay hydrated and satiated and feed your microbiome. But it, it's also where I think a lot of people have um, like, I would say some trauma and inexperience that they were just fed a bunch of crappy vegetables or plants that were boiled or old Brussels yeah. sprouts or garbage, like overcooked broccoli that stinks. And then they're like, told you got to eat this. It's healthy for you. And they're like, blah. And so <laughs> one of the big, for me, I had a lot of foods I didn't like. I didn't like pie. I didn't really like sweet potatoes. I didn't really like broccoli. I had a lot of foods that I had to kind of reacquaint myself with. I don't have to like force myself to eat them, but like I'd never eaten any seafood. And so like 10 years ago, if you're like, hey, I mix like uh, make a kale Caesar dressing, a nice Caesar dressing, I'd be like, like, yuck, like fish is disgusting. And I really over time learned and, and kind of developed my palate and love seafood now and, and all different types of fish. And I, and I did the same thing kind of thing with plants of just yeah. learning more about, I don't know, nothing complicated. It's like over roasting more vegetables, like things like, like fennel bulb. I'd never like roasted a fennel bulb and then you do it and you're like, Oh, that's really tasty. That's like, <laughs> and then you realize, wow, I feel like oh, basically any, somebody's like, oh, I read this uh, pro prebiotic foods, Jerusalem artichokes. What do you do with those? And I'm like, don't you do what you do with every other vegetable? It's like chop them up, put olive oil on them, put them in the oven, <laughs> see what happens, <laughs> pull it out. It's delicious. So. <laughs> yeah, that's so right. Who knew that broccoli, sorry, Brussels sprouts could be so delicious if they're just roasted. <laughs> I, um, I know, I'd I like to travel to, back to in I time. Like if I had a time machine and you got like a lot of extra time in it, like you got to like fart around for a long time. It wasn't like you only got like one trip back, but it would be kind of <laughs> fun to like go back in time to like when people were like around the table, like in the seventies, like eating these soggy Brussels sprouts, and like the kids are crying and you're like, <laughs> You like show up with like your balsamic oven roasted Brussels sprouts, like a little Parmesan sprinkled on them. You like slide them in, and I'm like, "What's that?" It's like I'm from the future. I brought Brussels sprouts. Like, These are Brussels sprouts of the future. It's like they are, and you'd be like, oh, "Wow!" And it's like, I'll see you in the future, and it's like, wow, "What happened last night?" It's like, "Oh, man, I'll Brussels so sprouts in the future." <laughs> And because we're sort I of in the '90s it. timeline, I sort of imagine Val Kilmer doing it to me. Just totally, Val in. Kilmer would totally be Brussels sprout, and he'd like he'd get out of the Back to the Future, he'd get out of like a DeLorean, right? And it'd be like total Val, <laughs> it'd be Val Kilmer. Kilmer. It would be like right after Top Gun. That would be like perfect Val Kilmer era. <laughs> Oh. Val Kilmer, if you hear this someday, I'd, I think you should make a like Back to the Brussels Sprout spoof um, <laughs> about going back. To the seventies um, and saving those poor people from soggy Brussels sprouts. Can we, um, while we're on this amazing thing of whole foods and Brussels sprouts, um, someone, someone listening to this, um, they're like, packaged foods bad. What? So you're saying like fast foods bad? Okay, why? What is the difference? Is it is it the fiber thing with whole foods? Like, if you were to distill it down to someone talking about going more organic, more you know, farm to table whole foods, what is it? I think it's too easy. So it ends up being bad for you because you don't chew, you don't get phytonutrients and you don't actually have a relationship with food that you control, but instead it's controlled for you by food industry and marketing. Hmm. Tell I us think more about that, was, the food industry. I was going to sum it up. I mean, I think for sure it, it's the fiber, but you can put fiber in processed food. I think for me, the, the part of food that maybe gets disconnected is we, you know, I love all of us, myself, I'm guilty, love geeking out about the science and that kind of justifies our opinion, whatever opinion you're arguing about food. And, and um, I, I think what often gets missed is the power and the importance of the relationship um, uh, with the self and the nourishing of the self. And, and so I think the problem with the processed food or one of the problems I have besides and we can talk about the biology and, and the short of that, I think people listening are, are educated on this and know is that you end up with a lot of simple sugars, a lot of refined or polyunsaturated or polyhydrogenated, sorry, polyhydrogenated, not polyunsaturated, um, fatty acids, you know, that, like trans fats and, and um, cottonseed oil and some flour seed oil. 
you end up with nutrients that are, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're all in supplement form. So sometimes, you know, there's not a lot of data on this, but there's some that you're just ending up not with the same diversity of nutrients that you would in a whole foods diet. And then you're missing phytonutrients, um, especially in their natural form. And so, you know, just, it's like a simple, simple thing. Tell me a place in nature besides honey, um, that you can find sweetness without fiber. Mm. It's, it's kind of hard to come up with one. Like I guess maple syrup, but like you got to drill into a tree for that. So that's a little, and then cook <laughs> it down for like days. Like you got to work for the maple syrup. So that doesn't like really count, but like we find sweetness, you know, an apple, a berry, uh, you find fiber with them. And uh, so, so fiber is certainly part of it. Um, Cool. And then, sorry, and then this new thing, right, that we're like, if you think that you're growing the wrong type of bacteria, let's just say by wrong, like more pro-inflammatory, more interested in like eating lots of sugars and making you crave lots of sugars, um, the, the processed food is going to cultivate and feed a microbiome that it, like loves processed foods, loves simple sugars, um, and, and, and there are just significant gut health consequences called dysbiosis, where people just end up with not the types of bacteria that you want living down there. Not that you can't survive. It's just not going to be optimal for your metabolic health and your brain health over time. Mm-hmm. Then there's the bad stuff. Then there's the nasties. See, there's so many. Answers. Sorry. Then there's the nasties, right? Then there's the stuff that like, who the hell knows? Like carrageenan, like who the hell knows? Nobody's ever put like seaweed proteins in your froyo before. It's like... I don't know, or like food dyes or stabilizers or plasticizers or just all this other stuff that tends to end up in more highly processed foods. Um, That's the, you know, like there's titanium dioxide in skim milk to make it white. And it's like, I don't know, I like my titanium dioxide on my nose. And I'm playing (laughs) volleyball in the sand with Val Kilmer and Top Gun. Like that's where I want my titanium (laughs) dioxide. I I don't know what I want in my skim milk. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Great thoughts. Um, so, Dr. Drew, you, you've you prepped us that there are 12 key nutrients for mental health. Could you tell us a bit about them? What are they? All right. So, the 12 key nutrients for mental health I established with Dr. Laura Lachance because as we begin to think about recommending foods to people for their overall brain health and mental health, to get any traction we really in the data, we need to really settle on an illness, we settle on depression as the most dis- disabling illness worldwide, and we're both psychiatrists. And then we looked at what nutrients had a significant level of evidence that they could prevent depression. So you look at a population that doesn't um, get enough iron, or you look at a population that struggles, doesn't get enough zinc consumption, that population has a higher incidence of depression. And and those nutrients also then needed to have some data that they could help in the treatment of depression. For example, you give people omega-3 fats and an antidepressant, and there's some data that they get better, uh, or same thing with, with, let's say, zinc or iron. We looked at uh, all of this data, and we saw that there were 12 nutrients that met our evidence levels to be included, and they just asked a very simple question. What natural foods have the most of these nutrients per calorie? What's called the nutrient density. And we created the, this is the antidepressant food scale. And the antidepressant food scale is the collection of natural foods. We listed the top 20 and top uh, animal and, and top 20 plant foods. And what's important isn't, I mean, everybody wants it like at the top is watercress and oysters. But what's most important, I think, for, for us and in our work, around this, Dr. LeChance and I really wanted people to see the food categories that get represented. So if you're really trying to get the most of these nutrients that look like they can help prevent and treat depression, um, we can say eat a Mediterranean style diet, but we wanted to get specific and give people food categories. So if you look at the top plants, they're leafy greens and rainbow vegetables and citrus. If you look at um, the, on the animal side of things, they're the bivalves, mussels, clams, and oysters, and uh, small fish and fish roe. So um, yeah, that, that's the, that's the antidepressant food scale and a little bit about how we came up with the 12 nutrients. That's what I focused on in the book in part, uh, to really try and emphasize a certain set of foods, but, but, uh, also to help 
people understand guys, my thinking of, of really starting out the book talking about neuroplasticity and inflammation and using some of uh, the illustrations in the book to um, help people with these principles and really drive them home. And I, and I hope help them drive their motivation that there's like so much you can do because it doesn't feel that way when you have anxiety or depression, like, you know, something's wrong and maybe you're not quite ready to see a mental health professional or you, for whatever reason, you don't have access to that. I wanted to have give people the information. There's stuff that you can do. And, and focusing on these food categories is, is I, I think one of the, one of the easy ways to, to help people get started. And, and, and I hope to empower people. And here I've been showing you guys the illustrations, right? Stuff like, you know, uh, inflammation, right? Where we can really kind of, I don't know, for me, I'm just a very visual learner. And so the idea of, of seeing the stuff and being able to kind of mull it over in a non-text form appeals to me. And, and also some of these concepts, um, around the nutrients and how they work in the brain. And then also my, my power players, which are just kind of the, the foods that really have the most, both bang for your buck, but also are kind of archetypal, you know, that, that like, if you're a brain foodie, you probably have them in your house, olive oil, cashews, anchovies, red peppers, kale, um, dark chocolate, eggs, things like that. Mm. Awesome. Um, red peppers. Capsicum, right? Is that what we're talking about? Is that the same thing? Red or are you talking about chili? <laughs> yeah, so the <laughs> capsicum is hot. That's in the yeah. capsaicin is in the is in the the hot chilies, and yeah. and there's a little interesting data on capsaicin and kind of what it does. But uh, more just the the red peppers is a great kind of addition that um, lots of vitamin C in a red pepper, good amount of fiber, good amount of phytonutrients, lots and lots of carotenoids and some lycopene in there. And so, and my son likes them. So that's why they make the list. (laughs) Winning. (laughs) So for any of our listeners that are tuning in and they're beginning their journey of mental health, they're just starting to put together the pieces of, okay, maybe this is more just than just like a need for a pill, you know, Um, where would you have them start? How can they start to incorporate these principles into their lives? I think the first places to realize is is self-compassion and realizing you probably know a lot about this stuff and to not in any way come to this material or open my book or or go to my website with any sense of like intimidation or judgment with really that, that if you're paying attention to your mental health, if you're thinking about feeding your mental health, you're beginning to consider the ways in which really your fork is a very powerful tool in terms of how your body takes that information and changes genetic expression really over time changes everything about your health. It's really empowering. It means there's so much that we can do in our everyday lives, not just, you know, fancy organic foods, but really simple, wholesome, traditional foods that have always nourished our brains. I really believe in our clinical practice, we try to meet people where they are. So wherever you are, uh, I would hope to hear a little bit about some challenges in front of you in the short term, whether it's a cooking skill you need, whether you're bored of salads or whether you're, let's say, eating at the school cafeteria and you don't think there's anything healthy there to really think in the short term about something really small. Like it could be starting to snack on nuts or really working on your sense of guilt. And so really doing some mindfulness exercises and eating dark chocolate and working on really enjoying it. Um, I would pick a couple of the food categories that we know are really helpful to people. And if you're good in them, celebrate that and kind of lean into it a little bit. So if you're a plant forward eater and you're crushing your leafy green game, but you haven't made pesto at home, um, that might be a way to, you know, bump things up a little bit, uh, but to expand within fat and food categories you're good in. And then if there are some challenging, and again, my quick rhyme, I say seafood greens, nuts and beans, and a little dark chocolate are some good categories to get started in. One that I love is, is since we've been talking a lot about gut health and health in the microbiome would be this week to maybe explore a couple of fermented foods. And again, not with the idea that like, wow, you know, I said it and the data says it. So now you've got to eat sauerkraut three times a week, but much more of if you're getting started. Um, when I got started, I'd never had any fermented foods that I could really remember. Yogurt. I'd never drank kefir. I'd never made sauerkraut. I didn't, you know, eat kimchi. There's a kimchi fried rice in the cook and the book has 30 recipes in it that I love. I love kimchi now. It's like my favorite thing to put in my ramen and my miso. So just sort of encourage, I want everyone to hear my encouragement of just letting your palate develop in small steps and explore your foodscape. 
I think that's a, I, I hope people feel um, hopefulness and empowerment in that. Beautiful. Right. Thank you. Um, I'm salivating thinking about the kimchi fried rice. <laughs> You must be hungry. <laughs> yes. And I am a We're kimchi have fan. Ralph Timner put, put that in with the side of Brussels sprouts when he beams in from the future, <laughs> yes. right? Future yes. yes. I'll kill my. Yes, do it. Sounds good. But thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Drew. It's been a really helpful call and really, we had fun too. So um, if anyone wants to learn more about what you do and maybe get, grab a copy of your book, how would they go about that? Yeah. And first of all, thank, thank you both, Matt and Sarah. It's nice to be a little silly and also have some fun, but talk about some serious stuff. And I really appreciate everything you both do to, to spread a message of, of wellness and positivity and, and eating right um, and, and mental health as well. And thanks for all you do to promote nutritional psychiatry. It means a lot to those of us who um, have been watching it grow up to see it really get embraced and people will be excited about it. And, and also hearing from folks who've had their own challenges about the you know, the testimony of its power and its ability to work to help shape our mental health. Um, I, I'm Drew Ramsey, MD, everyone. And so it's, I'm easy to find on Instagram. I'm Drew Ramsey, MD there. My website is DrewRamseyMD.com. And I have some, a couple interesting downloads of, you wanted to um, check those out, both um, brain food on a budget, but also some surprising antidepressant foods that I use a lot in my um, everyday life and cooking. Um, and, uh, um, and also some information on our course for clinicians. We have a nutritional psychiatry uh, clinician training course, as well as the e-course Eat to Beat Depression. So um, please check out the book, Eat to Beat Depression and Anxiety, a six-week plan. And um, I uh, mostly hope that some of this information resonates with you and gets you excited about the possibility and the power of feeding your mental health. Not that it's the only thing you need to do, but if it's something that you haven't been doing, it's a great tool at your disposal. And, and I really hope you hear my encouragement and I would say our encouragement to really start feeding your mental health and using your fork to improve your mental fitness. And uh, thank you so much. It's been really lovely speaking with you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Pleasure's been ours as well. And just to clarify, where can they get your book? Is it on Audible as well? Amazon? The book is on Audible. I narrated the book myself. So if you mm -hmm. haven't found my voice annoying over the past <laughs> little bit, I uh, want to hear more of it. And uh, it's a fun <laughs> Um, the books, the books on Audible. Um, it, it's on Amazon. It's on Indie Books. Um, it the uh, it should be out in Australia um, reasonably soon. I think it just came out. It was dropping in the UK in a couple of weeks. Um, uh, but yeah, I think the audio book is probably the easiest way if you can't get a physical copy. And um, yeah, well, thank you so much for your time and the work that you do. And please, everyone, check out um, Dr. Drew's amazing resources. We Eat to beat depression and anxiety available on audible <laughs> sarah should have done the intro um sarah, so yeah and, the intro. yeah and I, I think such an important work for this time obviously that we're going through so so many people need this information so thank, thank you, you so, so much. much thank you guys have a great night well have you got images of alchem or rocking out with brussels sprouts I think I'm too young. I just laughed along, but I don't actually know what Val Kimmel, Come on. Kimmel looks he like. He even referenced the volleyball <laughs> scene from Top Gun. Oh, yeah, I'm too young. Okay. <laughs> anyway, what, do you, what did you guys think of the interview? We would love to hear from you. Um, I, I thought it was amazing. Like there's so much there that you can take, take away. Um, but let us know in the comments. Uh, are you excited to regrow your brain? Yeah, it's exciting. To I think we can often feel like we're at the whim of our our brain and just what is is you know nothing we can there's nothing we can do about it but i think it was super encouraging we can regrow our brains with our daily habits you know that's wild yeah. and that's really cool so i'd love to know in the comments let us know what really stood out to you did, did you have any aha moments and many of you yeah. are not subscribed hmm. most of you that watch this <laughs> are not subscribed so please hit that like subscribe and notification bell because that just really helps the YouTube algorithm and to get this message out. And we do this as a free service just so, you know, more people can hear about this amazing new, um, you know, field of science and obviously have a breakthrough and an option beyond what the traditional medical model is offering. So right. definitely um, hit the like, subscribe button, share it with your friends. And uh, if you'd like to get more exclusive content or work with our coaches, we have a new thing called the goodness lover in a circle. Uh, reach out to us if you're interested in that because you will get exclusive content 
you will also get access to our amazing Facebook group where we have actual naturopathic coaches. And if you'd like to learn more about things or get some feedback on your health, why not get started on a free trial? That's awesome. That's in the link in the description. So check it out. And we look forward to seeing you in our next interview.